Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this year's Michel Camdesu lecture. I'm Tobias Adrian, the financial counselor of the IMF and director of the Monetary and Capital Markets Department. I'm very happy to welcome you to this lecture, which was created in the aftermath of the financial crisis, focused on central bank issues, particularly with respect to financial stability challenges. Previous uh, speakers have included Governor Yellen, Draghi, Zhu, and Carney, and it is our privilege and honor to welcome Elvira Nabiliona, the Governor of the Central Bank of Russia, for today's lecture. Welcome. Her lecture will commence in a few moments and will be followed by a conversation between her and the managing director, Christine Lagarde. Before that, it is my pleasure to give the floor to the managing director for her opening remarks. Thank you very much, Tobias, and good morning and welcome to all of you, and in particular to all the FDMDs who have decided to gather this morning uh, on the 19th Street. Good memories, I hope you have, but we're certainly thrilled uh, to have, I don't know if the chronological order will be respected, but I guess Stan Fisher, Ann Kruger, John Lipsky, and David Lipton, of course, our fi first Deputy Managing Director. <laughs> Elvira, if I may say, you prove the point that to be top-notch, competent in finance, you don't need to have white hair. <laughs> the other central bank governor who came here from our gender had white hair, and I'm glad that you don't. So it is a privilege to welcome you and to uh, listen to you in a few minutes. Um, you and I have something in common, which is our love for opera. And when I was last in St. Petersburg back in June, we had the pleasure of appreciating the sound, the uh, um, sonority, and the beauty of the uh, Marinsky Opera House. And uh, I think we would both agree that the opera art is one of the richest and most sophisticated art in the world except maybe for another art that you're going to tell us about, which is the art of being a central banker. And indeed, central banking requires fine mastery of many, many different disciplines. And nowhere is this more prominent than in the world of central banking in emerging markets. Now, why is that? Because these institutions tend to have a relatively higher share of challenges from evolving policy framework to more frequent external shocks, combined with scarce resources in some cases. So in that environment, much like in the world of opera, they can be considerable drama. They can be twists and turns, and eventually happy denouement. But those who enjoy Wagner in particular will concede that it may take time. The greatest um, near-term threat to global growth is the risk that trade and geopolitical tensions combine intensify with adverse effects on confidence, asset prices, investment, and growth. Now, this, of course, is a major challenge for emerging economies because it adds to a less supportive external environment. We all think also of the stronger dollar, tightening of financial conditions as advanced economies legitimately continue to normalize their exceptional and unconventional monetary policies. And again, this situation, particularly given the debt burden on some of them, is a challenge for many emerging economies because it has contributed to lower capital flows and rising costs of finance. 
these shifts are already testing the policy frameworks of some emerging market banks, and the IMF is supporting its members through a combination of policy advice as well as eventually financing, and it will continue to do so. But that is not the whole story. Even as they manage those external uncertainties, emerging market central bankers are also expected to meet a range of domestic challenges. For example, their financial systems may be less developed, or as in the case of Russia, the banking system may be undergoing a significant uh, cleanup and consolidation process. And under these circumstances, monetary policy transmission can be weakened. Meeting these challenges is not an easy task, especially for central banks that are seeking to build credibility and anchor inflation expectations while managing other potentially competing policy objectives. So how can this be achieved? Clearly, defined central bank mandates are critical, much like broad musical themes in an opera, actually. And yet there is no detailed sheet music. Otherwise, we would all know exactly what to do and how to do it, and when to play the right tone. Central banks are expected to write their own music as they adapt in real time to fast-moving scenario. And if they didn't do so, their independence would actually be questioned, which would probably weaken their sphere of influence. So in that process, clear public communications are key to ensure that policy actions are well understood and importantly to ensure legitimacy. As any opera lover knows, there's no great opera unless you have a fantastic conductor that shows strength of character, intuition, and leadership skill. And these are the qualities and the exceptional skills that Elvira, if I may call you so during this address, displays. You have the most distinguished carrier in government, finance, and central banking. I vividly remember your presence in G8 meetings, G20 meetings, whether as advisor, uh, top advisor to uh, the president, or as central banker as you became, the year when Russia was actually presiding the G20. As minister, you were minister of economic development for five years. You played a significant role in that respect. You were also directly advising uh, the top level authorities in Russia before you were eventually appointed to the position that you're currently enjoying. You took the helm of the Central Bank of Russia, one of the largest central banks in the world, with, listen to that, seven main branches, 74 divisions, and more to the point, operating in 11, 11 different time zones. Hmm. And uh, your leadership, the central bank helped cushion external shocks by moving to a fully flexible exchange rate and an inflation targeting regime. You have also noticeably strengthened the bank's public communication. And as a result of your resilience, determination, decisiveness, Inflation expectations in Russia today are much better anchored and at much lower levels as well than they were only a few years ago. At the same time, you have relentlessly consolidated Russia's expansive banking system, revoking more than 400 banking licenses and upgrading the regulation and supervision of the financial sector. And to do that, it takes, as those who can consider Russian history, including the most recent one, it takes guts and courage. It is therefore not surprising that you were named Central Banker of the Year by Euromoney in 2015 and by the banker in 2017, and I'm told that the investor has actually given you an A grade, and they can not be anything higher than that by their ranking. So, let me conclude by a quote from the poet uh, Auden, who once said, no opera plot can be sensible, for people do not sing when they are feeling sensible. 
But this is why you are so special, because you can make central banking sing while being very sensible indeed. So I'm deeply honored, Madam Governor, that you have accepted our invitation to deliver the fifth Michel Comte de Sue lecture. Michel, actually, whom I talked to, sends his very, very best regards. He could not travel here on this occasion, but he's very proud that you are today uh, the honoree of the lecture that was named after him. So I'm um, inviting you to uh, come to the podium, and I will join you back for a conversation that the two of us will have. Let me congratulate you even before you start. Thank you, Christine, for your kind words. I'm truly, truly honored to be here at the MF and uh, to have this great opportunity to speak about Russian monetary policy. It's a particular honor to be speaking here in honor of Michel Kamdisiu. My topic today is Russian uh, rocky road to inflation targeting. Is one I hope he, he would enjoy. Uh, after all, he helped us begin the journey. This year is a, a great time to reflect on some of the speed bumps we have encountered. As you know, the last five years have been far from easy. 2018, though, also marks the anniversary of not just one, but two major financial crises that deeply affected us. In just a few days, it will be 10 years since uh, the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Just a few weeks ago, it was the 20th anniversary of Russia's financial crisis. Michel Camdissou, as you know, was involved in addressing the consequences of 1998 crisis as well as Stanley Fisher, who is here with us today, and, and I'm very grateful for your advice and for your contri contribution that time. Uh, the connection of uh, Michel Camdissou, however, to Russia runs much deeper. In the early 1990s, the IMF and Michel Camdissou's main job was to support countries making the historic transition to market economies. A full three chapters of uh, Mr. Kamdisiu's memoir are dedicated to Russia and our struggle to build the foundations of a mar market economy and reach uh, macroeconomic stability. Here is what Michel Kamdisiu wrote about the Russian Central Bank in 1992. The MF teams discovered in Moscow the actual existence of a central bank which was hardly anything more than an office of the treasury, itself little acquainted with the most basic facts of, uh, of financial economy. While, say, New Zealand and Canada had already begun their transition to inflation targeting, Russia had only just started its transition to a market economy. And the Bank of Russia had yet to become a modern institution for monetary policy. Many years have passed and a lot has changed. Some of the key points of the original agenda, like mass privatization, tax reform, and fiscal consolidation, have been implemented. In the, 19, uh, in the 2000s, when oil prices were high, we built bo both fiscal and uh, foreign currency reserves. Bringing the inflation rate down to low single digits was probably the last item on the list. Over the last 25 years, we have experimented with a number of different monetary and exchange rate policy regimes in order to stabilize inflation. But like many other emerging markets before us, we were only able, uh, we were only able to reach low inflation after the introduction on, of inflation targeting. Still, our experience differs from those of other emerging market countries. Most of them introduced inflation targeting in the early 2000s, after the Asian crisis. It was the time of great moderation, when global markets were relatively stable, risks to financial uh, stability were low, and domestic macroeconomic and financial stability was fully dependent on domestic uh, policies. Inflation targeting worked relatively well for EMs in that environment. 
although even then inflation in emerging markets was some, somehow more volatile than in the advanced countries. The value of inflation targeting in emerging markets was proven during the global financial cri crisis, the European crisis, the taper tantrums, and so on. One of the conclusions from this experience, though, is that in order to preserve financial stability, central banks need more instruments at their disposal in addition to the ones required for inflation targeting. Russians, Russia's experience underscores the importance of that conclusion. In 2014, Russia introduced inflation targeting in the midst of financial turmoil. Since then, in external volatility and potential financial stability risks have been permanent features of the agenda. I should underline that inflation targeting has not only allowed us to decrease inflation, it has also become the basis for preserving financial stability. When a monetary policy framework is transparent and the policy itself is implemented in a classical, even orthodox way, markets are able to react to shocks in a more orderly way. And eventually markets become more self-stabilizing. However, our experience sh also shows that inflation targeting is not enough when there is constant uncertainty and risks to financial stability. Inflation targeting needs to be accompanied by macroprudential tools and special instruments to manage volatility. These tools are necessary even if a country has sufficient buffers, including international reserves and fiscal buffers. Allow me to illustrate this point with a story from our experience over the last few years. I begin by pointing out that the IMF, and not only the IMF, felt that um, pre the preconditions uh, for inflation targeting in Russia were very poor in the early 2000s. Many of the problems we faced were quite standard for emerging markets. Our financial markets weren't deep enough and poorly segmented. Our market institutions were weak. There was a high level of dollarization. Fiscal dominance prevailed. Food and utility prices had an, an outsized share in the consumer prices index. And Russians, largely financially illiterate at the time, were haunted by the memory of persistently high inflation. And that is not an exhaustive list. All of these factors restrained the transmission of monetary policy and inhibited the process of anchoring inflation expectations. Fur further complicating matter, Russia as an oil exporter suffered from Dutch disease. As a consequence, from time to time, Russia sustained significant terms of trade shocks and ex exchange rate shocks. It also had excessive private exter external borrowing. That is why we had to do a lot of preparation. Over the course of five years, the Bank of Russia built liquidity management instruments, gradually uh, winded the exchange rate band, and developed in-house modeling and forecasting capaci capacities. I would like to, to take this opportunity and uh, to thank the IMF for all the technical assistance during that time. But despite all our preparation, there were still doubts about whether we should take the final step and introduce full-fledged inflation targeting and the floating exchange rate. Those doubts only grew after the taper tantrum and two other significant shocks Russia faced in 2014. Uh, the first shock was related to the collapse of the oil price. Lest uh, anyone uh, has forgotten, the slide uh, shows exactly what oil prices have done over the last 10 years. Plummeting oil prices required large balance of payments adjustments. Exports decreased by 40% between uh, 2014 and 2016. A similar correction of imports was needed. The second shock that required adjustments to the balance of payments was geopolitical. That shock caused large capital outflows that were intensified by the forced deleveraging of external debt. You can see just how quickly the Russian banking and corporate sector deleveraged. Our opponents of inflation targeting had two main arguments. One, that inflation targeting isn't appropriate for a commodity exporting country, and two, 
that it is particularly inappropriate to introduce inflation targeting in a volatile period as it would significantly increase the exchange rate's volatility and destabilize markets. But we believed that the current account shock was precisely why we needed to accelerate the move to inflation targeting. One of, uh, one of the alternative suggestions was to apply capital controls. Uh, the Bank of Russia never gave that any thought. We believed capital controls would have a very negative effect in the long run, even if the, in the short term effect can be positive. If we use such a measure once, investors would expect us to use it again and again. Those kinds of expectations can significantly increase capital outflows and make the job of managing volatility more complicated. I would like to highlight four elements of our policy that proved to be essential in a, uh, in a situation when a central bank has to tackle two issues simultaneously. The first is to achieve its goal, low inflation, through radical change in monetary policy regime, and the second is to preserve financial stability. Those four elements are volatility management, resilience of the banking sector, central bank's independence and effective coordination with the government, and an active communication policy. Allow me now to elaborate. I'll begin with volatility management. The balance of payments shock uh, was particularly acute in our case because of the combination of a terms of trade shock prompted by the decline in oil prices and a capital um, account shock due to sanctions. Capital account shocks are common in emerging markets even without sanctions. They usually amplify current account shocks or maybe a, re a result of policy changes in reserve currency countries. Capital account shocks can be quite disruptive as they may cause excessive exchange rate volatility. However, while in the case of terms of trade shocks, exchange rate adjustments usually works as an automatic stabilizer, in the case of capital account shock, this is often not, not the case due to disruptions of the FX liquidity market and balance sheet effect. Therefore, I think that central banks of countries that are not of reserve currencies need to have not only local currency, by, um, but as well as FX liquidity management instruments. Of course, such tools should only be used temporarily to smooth out liquidity shocks rather than to mask actual exchange rate targeting. Finding a source of FX liquidity for central banks is another problem. In our case, we relied on our international reserves. In theory, there are uh, also other sources, ranging from the IMF and regional reserves arrangements and credit lines to swaps with the Fed or other advanced countries' central banks. So what did we do to address our volatility problem and adjust the balance of payments while getting inflation under control? First of all, we let the exchange rate adjust freely by switching to a floating exchange rate. While exchange rate volatility initially spiked, it then quickly fell. fell. Furthermore, especially with introduction of a fiscal rule, the exchange rate considerably decoupled from the price, oil, price of oil. Second, we tightened monetary policy by sharply um, raising the key rate to, to 17% and have retained some tightness of monetary policy since then. That policy allowed us to quickly stabilize inflation and inflation expectations after the initial jump. It also prevented deposit um, dollarization. That's why in uh, 2016, during the second fall in oil prices, people and the market reacted much more calmly than they had in 2014. Uh, Russians did not rush to the bank to convert their ruble accounts into foreign currency as they had in previous times to uncertainty. A very slow and cautious easing policy, which we have conducted since then, was the main factor that brought inflation down to our 4% target last year. Nonetheless, these two policy measures alone were not enough to resolve the issues with liquidity and volatility. As, as I mentioned earlier, we also introduced special FX liquidity tools to deal with companies and banks' abrupt loss of access to the global financial market. The second issue is the financial sector's resilience. In volatile times, the financial sector needs to be resilient enough 
to withstand shocks and to manage unavoidable credit and interest rate risks. We started working on strengthening the banking sector back in 2013. That policy involving uh, improving regulation and supervision, it also means reading the banks, banking sector of weak institutions. Over the last five years, as Christine said, we have withdrawn about 400 banking licenses. That's more than a third of all banks. The financial sector's resilience is not only about the health of the individual institutions. We were very lucky we didn't have any major bubbles in the market in 2014. Just a year before, unsecured retail lending was growing at an excessive rate of 60% year on year, a highly dangerous situation we managed to resolve with macroprudential measures. Had we not started cleaning up the banking sector and dealt with uh, runaway lending, we would have faced much more severe problems. In terms of volatility, many emerging markets face another serious concern. Their financial institutions often have a high level of FX lending. In this situation, central banks face a dilemma. They need to allow the exchange rate to adjust while ensuring that the financial system with excessive FX exposure remains stable. It's not always easy to find the right combination of tools to preserve financial stability and curb inflation. We had this trade-off too. When we hiked the key rate, we restrained inflation by stabilizing the exchange rate and dampening aggregate demand. At the same time, this rate hike, along with currency depreciation, increased the risk of a systemic banking crisis through the spike of interest rate, FX, and credit, credit risks on the bank's balance sheets. We had to account for the weak balance sheets of quite a few banks that had not built sufficient capital buffers. We used forbearance measures to buy them time to adjust. One of the measures allowed the banks to calculate their regulatory ratios using a notional fixed exchange rate for 15 months. Unsurprisingly, many of the banks wanted the, this holiday period uh, to continue indefinitely. And, uh, throughout that period, uh, we took steps to convince the banks that forbearance was only temporary and that the policy of strengthening regulation and supervision would be maintained in order to guarantee the financial sector's resilience. The government, for its part, introduced a banking recapitalization program. Both state and privately owned banks were able to participate. That program really helped that, uh, the banks and their clients come down. Nonetheless, these measures were not able to solve all of the problems. Many emerging markets face a problem of excessive external corporate borrowings. A large part of these loans can be sourced directly from global markets. For example, at the end of uh, 2014, uh, the Russian market was deeply concerned about corporates' massive debt repayments coming due when we were shut up uh, of international market. That concern was one of the reasons market volatility spiked. Unfortunately, central banks do not have enough macroprudential tools to influence corporate borrowing. It is a financial stability issue which central banks need to address together with governments. In Russia, we are currently discussing whether it's worth introducing something like DTI, debt to income, for corporate lending into banking regulation. Many banks also had to address the growing problem of FX borrowers who did not, who did not have export-based FX revenues and failed to make their payments. NPLs were particularly high in such cases. We began to stimulate banks to decrease the share of FX lending and FX deposits on their balance sheets. Such measures include higher risk weights for FX loans and higher reserve requirements for FX deposits. While we appreciate the IMF has frowned on this in the past, we found it to be very useful. Let us get back to our policy elements. Uh, item three on my list uh, is the issue of central bank independence and coordination. In emerging markets, countries with mostly weak institutions, the independence of the central bank is only trusted after it's tested. While Russia's central bank is independent uh, by law, the real test of its independence came in uh, 2014. Uh, that's when we took decisive action despite strong criticism from many in business, society, and even in the government. 
Our opponents did not always behave nicely. For example, one businessman asked me if we had come from outer space and suggested it was a good time to send us back. Uh, many thought that inflation target was the stuff of uh, science fiction. We had to be consistent in implementing and communicating our policy ga um, to gain the market uh, confidence. Uh, that made risk premiums go down, making, making the job of managing volatility easier for us. You can measure that in the yield curve. For a couple of years, uh, it was inverted. Until recently, it was flat because the market trusts our ability to decrease inflation. Even after the recent geopolitical shocks, Russia's long-term rates are not all that different than those of the countries with similar inflation targets. I hope I am not jinxing anything here. I should say gaining the market's trust once doesn't guarantee that you will always have it in the future. The trust gets retested every time there is a crisis. Meanwhile, central bank independence should not lead to the lack of coordination with the government. Yes, we have our own lanes, our own areas of responsibility, but the governments and central banks need to take into consideration measures introduced by the other party. Coordination with fiscal policy is especially important. Fiscal dominance is a major problem for many central banks. Thankfully, Russia is in a relatively good position on that front. We have a new and very strict uh, fiscal rule. When oil prices are above $40 a barrel, we will put the excess income into our reserves. Budget consolidation has helped a lot in achieving our goals. These measures have not only improved macro stability, but have also contributed to a reduction in the exchange rate volatility. And of course, fiscal buffers decrease the probability of currency crisis in the future. A central bank's communication policy can also be a very important tool for gaining trust and anchoring inflation expectations. We had to change our approach to communication significantly over the last several years in order to build market trust. In the past, the Bank of Russia rarely explained or announced its actions. In fact, the central bank rarely said anything at all. With inflation targeting, we had to develop the various tools for communicating to increase the market and general public's understanding of what we were doing. I remember one episode from 2014 particularly well. When we raised uh, the key rate to 17%, the information about our decision was published late at night. The following day, the markets were very nervous. They thought because it was announced in the middle of the night, it must have been taken in panic. All kinds of rumors uh, started to circulate. But the answer why we did it at night was actually very simple. Russia has 11 time zones, and we needed the banks in the Far East, hours and hours ahead of Moscow, to know the new rate before they opened their doors. Needless to say, we didn't communicate our rationale very well. Since then, we've de developed a whole set of communication tools, fixed times uh, to key monetary policy releases, regular meetings with journalists, analysts and investors, press conferences, interviews, social media out outreach, financial literacy website, and so on. Of course, all of that sounds pretty standard, and it's, after all, the standard of communication for a modern central bank. But it wasn't standard for us, and we have spent a lot of time building on that system. First, we needed uh, people uh, to acknowledge, okay, we understand what you are saying. Our task now is to get them to say, we believe you and uh, we trust your judgment. Despite the several shocks, the Russian economy has adjusted uh, rather quickly, thanks at least in part to these four elements of policy. The economy contracted 3.6% in the wake of the 2014 uh, crisis, three times less than what we saw during the great financial crisis. The balance of payments adjusted as well. The current account surplus is now our expectations for this year, about 5% of GDP. Drastic financial consolidation reduced the budget's break-even price for oil to $60 a barrel from $100. Corporate debt levels are normal. 
uh, household debt is quite low and uh, public debt is very low. Unemployment is at historically low level and close to the natural unemployment rate. Now it's 4.7%. Inflation, meanwhile, was brought down to 2.5% by, by the end of last year. It is now on its way back uh, to our 4% target. And although inflation has been below our target for the last few quarters, the Bank of Russia hasn't rushed to cut rates. We need to keep our monetary policy relatively tight to control current internal and external risks to inflation. Growth at the same time is between 1.5% and 2%, in line with our estimations for potential growth, but it is still it is too low. Like everywhere else, monetary policy can only do so much in Russia. It cannot increase potential growth. Potential growth low level is Russia's main domestic challenge. Structural policies must address economic uh, diversification as well as the issues related to our aging population and improve productivity. These highly needed uh, structural policy, fiscal policies, could have an impact on monetary policy. The Russian government, for example, has recently announced a number of fiscal initiatives. The expectation is that they will have a positive supply side effect. At the same time, measures like a hike in VAT could prompt inflationary pressure, which can in turn amplify inflationary pressure from external shocks. If that happens, our monetary policy will have to remain tight and may even get tighter. We believe that our monetary policy does not have any material negative effect on economic growth because the main restraints are of a structural nature. Moreover, our low inflation rate policy is stabilizing markets, consumer and business confidence. This positive externality offsets the negative effect of tightness. This is why we believe that the sacrifice ratio in Russia was close to zero. Structural changes, fiscal consolidation, and cautious monetary policy are interrelated parts of domestic economic policy. But as an open economy, with a big share of international co commerce in GDP and with an open capital account, Russia is not immune to external shocks. The Russia's economy's three biggest external risks are related to oil, policy normalization, and uh, geopolitics. The first two are well-known and expected risk factors, and we have taken precautionary measures for them. Geopolitical events, not only sanctions, but also trade wars and potential currency wars are different. They are much less predictable and subject to contagion, uh, to contagion and spillover effects, which are often not clear ahead to, of time. It forces us to build even more uh, buffers. We are in an interconnected world where trade measures against one country or sanctions against one company can have global effects. And when countries need to answer by building outsized buffers, it can become a drag on the global economy. I believe that we should at least discuss these issues in a similar ma manner as we discuss monetary policy spillovers. To conclude my lecture, I would like to reiterate the thesis I made at the beginning. Our experience shows that inflation targeting in an emerging market country can be an essential part of the financial stability framework, but it needs to be augmented by volatility management instruments and buffers. All of this, the IT framework, its instruments, are well known and widely implemented. They are commonplace. The trick lies in getting their application right, getting their combination, exact doses, and timing correct. All decisions need to be adjusted to local market conditions and specific shocks. We central bankers tend uh, to construct policy with uh, ready-made bricks and pieces, like we are building something with Lego. But modern policy making and its constituent parts are very different from the Lego you know. It's, uh, it's a lot more like the Lego equivalent uh, we had when I was a kid in the Soviet Union. The bricks were imperfect, and to get them to fit together, you had to make manual improvements, cutting angles and uh, drilling holes and so on. Sticking to the analogy, central bankers need to be flexible, not only when it comes to choosing the parts, but in reshaping them to better fit local market composition. 
That said, once a policy framework has been decided, there is no room for compromise, especially in volatile times, where there are constant risks to financial stability. If there is one thing I've learned over the last five years, we must be persistent and consistent. Thank you very much for your kind attention. No, Elvira, I have to confess something. When we prepared for that event, I had some comments by some who said, you remember some of the previous central bank governors, they were very cerebral, translate obscure. Elvira hopefully will be more practical. I have to say that you are an absolute perfect combination of cerebral and practical, so <laughs> well done. That was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. I promised Elvira one thing. I will not speak too fast because I cannot speak Russian. And while Elvira masters English language quite well, it's not your normal way of expressing yourself. So I will speak slowly. And if I go too fast, you just push <laughs> okay. I want to take you back to 2013. Must have been June or July when the president whom you've been advising for a year asks you if you are prepared to become the governor of the Central Bank of Russia. You know the situation because you're familiar with the Russian economy. You know that a lot of work has to be done in relation to the banking sector, cancelling licenses, closing down banks, doing hard things. A former deputy governor of the Central Bank of Russia has been assassinated by uh, a former uh, banker. You know that the situation is dear. You don't have that many tools. And you know that monetary policy needs to be re redefined. How does it feel? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but 2013 was a very different. Uh, when I first presented my uh, speech. I, I was uh, making my speech to the parliament when parliament should vote for, for my person as a governor. I thought that uh, my task would be easier because uh, I thought that I will ease monetary policy, low interest rates, uh, because the situation was quite st stable. I knew that the banking system uh, require a lot of improvements yeah. and require uh, strengthening of rules, of supervision. It was clear that uh, banking financial banking sector is not in, in a good shape. It was absolutely undercapitalized with bad practices, with uh, money laundering institutions, and that's why I, I thought that it it would it would be my uh, my focus, not monetary policy. But the first, uh, the first challenges were, was monetary policy in 2014. But hopefully, hopefully, the Bank of Russia had done a lot of work to prepare inflation targeting. Mm. Because the inflation targeting first was announced in 2006. Hmm. It was a very long preparation, very slow. Um, and we needed to accelerate this work. And to, for example, to introduce key rate, policy rate. It was no one rate that can anchor all, all rates in the economy. Um, but it was uh, quite interesting work. And really, I would like once again uh, to, to thank IMF staff because uh, you provided us a, a lot of international experience of countries that made the same things. And um, it was very helpful. Well, I know you have here two key players. Um, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Thompson was very active, <laughs> and David Lipton paid a few very significant trips to Russia at the time to provide all the support that we could, and the whole MCM department was, uh, was certainly uh, tasked to, to give support to this very uh, decisive. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there is a moment when you must have said, okay, we are moving, we're going ahead with inflation targeting. 
Well, it was in 2014. Maybe you so remember. So the price of oil had gone down by then. Before, before, before the this decline in oil prices, it was uh, just after taper tantrum, okay. and we experienced this volatility time because of taper tantrum, and our, our ruble uh, was under pressure, and it was um, evident that we should accelerate our movement to to, to inflation targeting. But it was promised uh, to complete this inflation targeting by the end of 2014. We did it maybe two months ahead of the of this schedule, previous schedule. So you had mass, you have volatility. The uh, crisis of oil is is looming, although not completely um, ongoing. But you, you decide to go ahead with inflation targeting. Mm -hmm. What today, you know, reflecting on those last um, five years, what advice would you give to central bank? governors in emerging market economies that are also facing, as we know, um, volatility, pressure, and uh, who uh, are wondering whether they're doing the right things? I think the most important thing is to have buffers. Buffers in what and currencies? Not, not have imbalances. Not, okay, not no imbalances. imbalances. And buffers, different types of buffers. Uh, international um, reserves. It's one buffer, mm -hmm. fiscal buffers. It's uh, very important. And uh, uh, eliminate all, all of imbalances. As, as you've said, uh, to keep your, your house in order, or even better, to fix your, uh, the roof while, uh, while uh, the sun is shining. And even if uh, the roof is leaky, you should continue fixing it even if it starts raining. You cannot postpone it. I think that should be applauded. In, in, in case of Russia, we uh, created a lot of buffers. But even with buffers, we, um, we, we don't feel our, in absolutely safe place because the volatility and the movement of capital uh, flows we are the country with um, rare can, uh, emerging market countries with open capital account. Yeah. Uh, and that's why we should be prepared to this volatility. And that's why we, I think it's very important to have these tested instruments to manage um, uh, volatility of foreign currency. To have tested instruments, to have infrastructure to conduct some operations, and to have uh, resources to, to, to provide uh, uh, effects um, uh, foreign currency to markets in the times of volatility. It's not the intervention in, intervention in a standard way. It's not, uh, to, to, it's not the, the target, uh, to target uh, the level of currency. It's only to smooth this volatility. But we are very cautious with these instruments uh, uh, exactly for that reason. Uh, when we switch to free floating regime, markets uh, were for a long time, very suspicious about if we really switch to free floating regime or not. And even the operations to smooth the volatility with interventions can be considered as the um, going back to, going the, old back to the, the old regime. That, that's why we may be more cautious than other emerging markets in using these instruments. So how did you convince them that, yes, you were serious about that, yes, you were predictable, and you would even be orthodox. I heard you say that earlier today, by being orthodox. Mm, no, we, no, we only continue uh, explaining our goals and uh, follow our goals. That takes me to communication skills. Oh, because you, you changed the communication pattern of the Central Bank of Russia. Before you, there was not a lot of communication. And you did open the doors, the windows, and uh, you used to social media. How did, how did you frame that? And how, what language do you use with the financial experts and with the markets and with the analysts whom you see regularly? And how do you communicate with the Russian, now much more financially literate than mm -hmm. they were? It's one of the challenges to communicate rightly with markets, with professionals. And I think we have quite good contact with them. Sometimes they, 
they think that our um, uh, actions could be explained better and uh, that we should be more predictable. But general public um, is uh, quite challenging um, because we need to adapt our language mm -hmm. to, uh, to make our language more accessible for them. Because general public um, uh, start to address to our explanations in bad times. When it's good, uh, general public cannot even notice our existence. But uh, um, in bad times, we should be very careful. That, that's why we use different channels. And uh, one of the challenge is uh, the recent increase in importance of social media. Yeah. And we know that general public trusts social medias even more than, for example, professionals. That, that's why we see that, and that's why we should communicate properly through social media as well. And we try to do this. And uh, one more challenge in communication policy is related to forward guidance, because markets uh, mm, uh, get accustomed to forward guidance by large central banks. And they expect from other central banks uh, to, to, to have some commitments about monetary policy, about policy rates. Um, uh, and, uh, they think that it's more predictable. Um, and, uh, we try to explain more about our logic, how we interpret data, what factors are important uh, to make these decisions. Uh, but nevertheless, markets want some 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 predictions of our policy, mm, and, uh, wouldn't, uh, but uh, the central banks, I, I, I I'm sure, uh, should keep some flexibility to uh, to react to uncertainties and to be predictable but flexible. It's not easy in communications with markets, and it, it's very uh, important not to be hostages of the markets, but uh, to be uh, transparent and predictable for them. I think so, you, so you do provide some forward guidance, uh, but only so much so that you can vary from... We provide some um, uh, types of forward guidance. Uh, it's the guidance of the stance of our, our policy, but mm -hmm. with a lot of caveats, um, I think, like this. But we can change uh, even... Uh, if, if, some, if something happens in the economy, if our forecasts uh, uh, revise, uh, revi are revised, we can um, signal the market that we can change it. For example, recently we've stopped our easing policy because of a lot of uh, um, uh, new factors, mm -hmm. internal and external factors, and uh, we uh, uh, said that we will continue tight policy for a, for a while. You mentioned uh, many buffers, and one of them is fiscal buffer, macroprudential buffers. You also mentioned the fact that there has to be some cooperation with the, uh, with the fiscal authorities. How does it work in practice? How do you operate with the Minister of Finance and with other authorities? While securing and maintaining your independence, which, you've also, which you have also mentioned. Yeah, the, uh, the independence doesn't mean that there is no uh, conversations, there is no coordination, there is no um, uh, speaking uh, each, uh, uh, with the Minister of Finance. We discuss the situation in the economy, uh, our vision of this situation. It's, it's more about the exchange of information. Mm. So you don't it's go and knock on the door of Minister Silvanov to say, what are you doing with your fiscal policy? We need this. <laughs> no, not of course. No. It's, it's uh, the, uh, their responsibility. But we are happy that... Uh, and he doesn't do that with you? No. no. Wouldn't dare. <laughs> but we are happy that they uh, conduct this policy of financial consolidation. I think it's important in our country and um, this combination um, of uh, cautious monetary policy and... Uh, uh, and fiscal surplus, because that's what... Fiscal surplus. Talking. We have trade, uh, uh, current account surplus and fiscal yeah. surplus. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's, qu it's quite uh, 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 big buffers. Yeah, secure position. Mm -hmm. Plus your fiscal rule, which is after a good debate between... Maybe one buffer yeah. that we uh, lack, it's... Uh, enough diversification of our economy. Yeah. We have no structural buffer because uh, 
uh, it's oil and gas oil and, oil gas, and gas oil and gas even if it's uh, declining now but uh, we still rely on oil and gas and that's why we should diversify our economy we should in, uh, improve the productivity and to have this structural buffer in the, our economy there's one area where um, Russian experts are quite famous and that is um, math sciences physics as well as computer sciences I'm sure you have a few computer sciences at the bank who are looking at fintech, who are looking at virtual currencies. Is this something that we could envisage going forward that central banks, including the Central Bank of Russia, actually launches its own virtual currency as other central banks <laughs> consider? I think uh, the central bank's uh, the cr uh, cryptocurrency, it's some remote future, uh -huh. maybe maybe it can be, but it's too early to think seriously about um, central bank cryptocurrency. It's my, my view. Uh, but uh, we are very cautious with this phenomenon of cryptocurrencies. I know that um, people, I mean, people like cryptocurrency as the uh, reflection of uh, new financial technologies. Mm -hmm. Indeed, financial technologies are, are great and uh, uh, the technology uh, which is the basis of cryptocurrency, uh, uh, distributed ledgers, yeah. is very pro uh, promising technology, but it's not quite mature. But I see more uh, uh, disadvantages in cryptocurrency. Uh, as for now, uh, uh, it's uh, it's very volatile asset. Mm -hmm. Maybe is more volatile than the most volatile financial assets that we know. And that's why the issue of uh, consumer protections and investment yeah. protections is very, very important. Mm, um, it can be used uh, for money laundering. Yeah. yeah, we can see it. It's not can it, now the technology is uh, mm, that cannot secure us from cyber security from from cyber. Crimes. Are you concerned about cyber security? Yeah, of yeah. course. Yes, of course. We uh, we pay a lot of attention to. Um, uh, improve uh, all the systems of cyber securities in the financial system. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important. And that's why now in the, in the in cryptocurrency uh, is attractive for people who want quick money. They, they, they speculation. Should, they more. should understand that they can lost lose lost this money. But we think uh, we should think about uh, why this so attractive for people. It's not only for money laundering and uh, other things. It's fast, it's cost effective, it can uh, smooth transactions uh, between countries. That's mm -hmm. why we should develop uh, these types of services that are uh, very attractive for, for mm -hmm. people. And it's the point that uh, we should think about. Well, you would certainly not please the originators of uh, bitcoins and others who wanted to do away with central banks and, and organize their own uh, flows and, and transactions. But, uh, but about central bank uh, digital money, it's too early, I think, because we, we don't know the impact of this on the banking sector as a whole, yeah. when central bank should be the, the only provider of, of money and how it can uh, influence uh, financial stability. Mm. It's, very unknown territory, and we should more analyze this than before taking decisions. Right. You mentioned um, de-dollarization, and this is certainly an area where Russia has uh, has demonstrated its achievement. Um, what What are the main lessons uh, that Russia can draw from that de-dollarization, particularly concerning the private sector? Dedollarization is a, it's a very difficult process. Mm -hmm. We had a very high level of dollarization in the uh, 90s. Yeah. It was about 70%. And then in 2000s, dollarization uh, can dec uh, started uh, declining. But the first reason was the stable ruble, the stable um, currency, even appreciating currency. That's so why people, people felt confident they confident did not have to hold dollars. Now, uh, with flexible uh, currency, we should base the dollarization process on low inflation. It's not easy because uh, the people's mind is more concentrated on, uh, on currency than on um, at the level of inflation. Really? Yeah. But 
it's changing. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why we uh, try to um, implement special, additional special measures uh, to uh, stimulate banks to this de-dollarization. I've said for we have different uh, coefficient risks for mm -hmm. uh, foreign, uh, foreign currency lending, and we have higher uh, reserve requirements for foreign deposits. And we see that it, ca it, it has effect on banking system. And, and now we have this uh, trend on de-dollarization. OK, so you associate risk weighting um, principles to currencies denominated instruments, mm -hmm. any of them. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to ask you something about your board. You have an unusual board. Twelve members, five women. Very unusual in the is world of unusual? central bankers. Is it unusual? Yes, it is. Oh, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is. And two less women. Hmm? Two less women. Two, two, two few women. Too few. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. In our board. In our world <laughs> in general, yes, I agree with that. Uh, how, di how did you manage that? How, what, what kind of policies, what kind of pipeline, what kind of incentives did you put in place in order to increase this diversity that, that is clearly displayed at the highest level at the bank? Mm. Oh. It wasn't like that always. Uh, frankly speaking, it was no special policy promoting mm -hmm. women. Uh, we promote uh, professionals right. and um, support of principles of merit merit meritocratic policies. Yeah. Uh, and it happened that uh, there are a lot of women. <laughs> but you are right, it's not common even in um, the Russian financial sector. For example, when I speak at financial conferences, 90% of yeah. uh, audience are men, and uh, there are a uh, few women in the financial sector. I think we should improve this situation. Um, but there is no special discrimination rules. Mm -hmm. For example, when I was appointed uh, as a central bank, the critics said it, 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 it was bad, not because I, I, I am a woman, but because I am not from the central bank. And, uh, but central banks are usually very conservative and they are not very uh, easy to, op to new ideas, to new, new people. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, I'm, I, I, I'm more concerned about this type of diversity to uh, attract more people from, uh, with different experience yeah. from, different mar uh, from, from markets. For example, with financial technologies, when we uh, decided to make this as a, pri as a priority of our activity and to create competence in the central bank. We need someone from the market to create this competence. And this person happened to be a woman. In the financial technology sector. In the financial technology. Yes, but we, I think we should uh, lower barriers for women to, to make their, their development because in general they, they, they should combine two jobs, family and the yeah. real job, yeah. and yeah. even if they brilliantly educated, if, with a strong self-esteem, with ambitious ambitions, they leave race because they, they cannot combine all these two jobs and we should create possibility with, with flexible uh, uh, hours of work, part-time work like this. Childcare center. Yeah. But in, fin in the financial sector, it's very difficult because the financial sector is with long working hours, with very tough competition. Well, especially when you have 11 time zones to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> You've done a lot of work in sanitizing the banking sector in Russia. Suspending or closing down 400 bank licenses is, is no small job. There is more to be done. Do you feel that, I mean, you're halfway through, two thirds of the way, and how will you sort of complete that task which was your priority uh, when you started as a governor? It's very difficult to, to, to assess where we are, we are, but I think we are close to completion of this work because a lot of uh, uh, work has been has been done, but you know we we've dealt with very uh, deeply rooted 
problems, problems and habits because the banking system of Russia is quite young. In the early 90s, in five years, 2,500 banks were created. In five years. 2,500 banks, banks in, five five, years? in five years. You can understand that they were created without ca real capital. Mm. And uh, then they received this habit to misreporting because there, is, there were no capital and they, their reports were admitted. Mm -hmm. uh, some banks were created uh, to finance um, owners' businesses, to collect uh, deposits and to finance um, uh, owners' businesses. And it was the second pro uh, big problem that we have to dealt with. The third problem, some banks were created to um, uh, to money laundering, yeah. make money laundering. That w that's why we have to withdraw so many licenses. Uh, but uh, the positive effect of this activity is that remaining banks, they are stronger. Mm. They created real capital. They created needed reserves, buffers. That's why I think uh, now we are in quite uh, stable situation and uh, the resilience of financial system has increased a lot. But we will continue this work and it's very uh, important uh, to keep uh, this, uh, uh, this level of uh, um, regulation and supervision. Are bankers terrified of you? <laughs> They should be. Uh, uh, they, they ask uh, us, and we answer them, that we should create a partnership and some cons consultative dialogue uh, type uh, supervision. We try. We try. We understand that they have uh, huge challenges. For example, it's not easy for them to live in the low inflation environment. They used to live in uh, the environment with high inflation and margins were high. Yeah. Now they should uh, reorganize the, their business models and to, uh, to be more cost effective because of low inflation. But they should increase their productivity. That's why they, they have a lot of challenges. With financial technologies, they have these yeah. tough competitions with technology companies. Let me understand that. We have a lot of challenges and we will help them to create uh, uh, some efficient models. So you will have them respond to those challenges. Yeah. Well, Madam Governor, you certainly are a, a role model for many of us, not just female, but males as well. And I would like to thank you for this lecture and this conversation. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.